will be so I will be sharing my screen um, just to show you a few slides um, to look at um, geography as um, the opportunity for you um, to, to choose at the university, um, keeping in mind uh, the type of webinar um, choosing geography. So one hopes that um, this just um, well, encourages you more and, and um, for those that are already interested, um, gets you even more excited about, about geography. So geography, at least coming from geographers, of course, um, we say geography is the most vital subject on the planet. And we say this, of course, because we love the subject, but also because it's the truth. When we think of geography and when we think of um, the situations we find ourselves in at the moment um, with regards to global, local, and uh, national levels, we see that indeed the understanding of such processes, um, particularly the geographical uh, perspective of, of such processes, um, lends, lends us right at the center of much of what is happening. We have growing urbanization, uh, we really don't really need to look at um, almost pictures from abroad nowadays. We can also look outside our windows and we start looking and seeing um, how urbanization is, is, is unfolding also in our little island. Um, the anthropogenic impacts of, of population growth and that the conflict with the environment um, that's around us. The natural landscapes, of course. Um, here I, I, I have a selection of the local landscapes and, you know, a better understanding would have probably um, helped us understand better um, and, and um, deal with the loss of the other window, as an example, probably a bit better than, than we did. And of course, uh, we are part of a global community and therefore we need to also look at the challenges that are there at a the global level. And geography, um, through its almost interdisciplinary approach, um, helps us to contribute towards a better understanding and towards the solutions um, which will help us reach the sustainable development goals. But geography isn't just a, a subject about knowledge, it's also about skill. And uh, if we look at uh, what kind of skills geography provides um, those that eventually go into uh, this field of study. We're looking at uh, the ability and willingness to ask questions. And believe me when I tell you that there are a lot of people that do not have that capacity to think and, 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 and the willingness to ask um, those, those important questions, okay? The why, the where, and the how. Um, we, of course, acquire skills as geographers into the um, acquisition of geographic information. We are able to locate, we are able to collect, we observe, we read, we record through various, of course, um, tools uh, and technologies today as well. We organize geographic information, system, uh, geographic information through systems as well. So we, we are able to um, map effectively um, information we are able to graph and tabulate and, and more importantly present because today geographic information has basically taken over our world. If we look at our mobile phones, if we look at, at the news, if we look at, at, at um, uh, newspapers, they all have locational information. So the skill to be able to organize that information and portray it in an effective um, way and communicating that information correctly is critical. We are able to analyze geographic information, and this is another skill which we learn when we study geography. We learn how to analyze patterns, relationships, trends, and connections between the human and the environment and, and the physical environment, which are of course where we find mo most conflict. And as a result of all these skills, we are able to answer geographic questions. We are able to draw up conclusions which help policy, which help um, decision-making, which informs 
those that are to make the decision. Maybe we will become ourselves decision makers. And therefore we are able to use the information to answer problematic questions. Hmm? There is an array of skills which we, we cover within, within the program um, at the university. We uh, put in together literacy and numeracy through a number of um, um, study units, but also through a number of tools, including ICT. We now extended our program to include also um, very statistical um, tools, which we use, including R, um, which is an open source um, uh, statistical package. We, of course, extend the use of GIS within our or geographic information systems within our program. So there's a lot. And then, of course, oral and written communication, which we do through assignments and, and presentations. We look at teamwork, which is a very, very important um, element in our program. We look at the field, which, of course, is our playground uh, um, for us to be able to collect information and interact with the team. And so it is an all encompassing subject. And frankly, this is one of the biggest um, and strongest um, advantage that geographers have over other, um, other um, disciplines. Here I've put together some reasons um, why we study geography. Um, some of you, if you come from, from a geography background, you'll, you'll easily um, relate to some of them. Um, basically to understand basic physical systems that affect everyday life. Um, so you know, we can easily see how um, a, a decline in rain will affect um, um, other processes, both within the physical system, but also within the human environment. Um, to learn the location and physical and cultural characteristics of places. So once we understand um, places, we are able to look at how they function more effectively, and particularly in, in, in an interdependent world, because of course what we do has an impact on, on others and what others do have an impact on us. Huh? So, um, you know, Malta is in a standalone island in the middle of nowhere, the impacts of the Sahara Desert and, and Sicily, Etna, the activities, they all are interdependent. We understand how geography has played important roles in the evolution of people, ideas, places, and environments. And this is very, very important because in understanding what has happened, we reduce the risk of repeating the mistakes, uh, which is something which a lot of people um, tend, tend to do. Because of the skills, the mapping skills, and our appreciation of the spatial relationships, we are able to understand where places and events happen. We are able to see how communities um, grow in this respect. And of course, we explain the processes of human and physical systems and how these have changed the surface of the earth. You know, the growing climate change concerns. It's all about understanding what has happened, um, what is happening with regards to the physical and anthropogenic world and where this is going. Hmm? And if we see, of course, climate change as being the next or the current and the next um, challenge for human, human beings, then automatically we understand why these are uh, important reasons. We understand the spatial organization of society and we often um, understand what seems to be um, a random scattering of people and places, but through our understanding of spatial organization, we are able to appreciate better why certain things happen and where. The issue of scale, uh, we recognize spatial distributions at all scales and how um, what happens at the local level has an impact on the national level and what happens at the national level has an impact on the regional level. And so what we do um, in terms of an island, for example, has an impact on the surrounding regions. Hmm? Um, to be able to make sensible judgments about methods involving relationships between physical environments and society. We see a lot of um, information, a lot of facts that are coming out every day on the news, but there are very little, um, uh, there is very little 
judgment and understanding of much of what, what goes out in terms of facts and figures huh, out there. And of course, we, through geography, appreciate more than ever the fact that Earth is our homeland and we need to manage its resources wisely so that we can live sustainably. And then, of course, the idea that as geographers and because of all the other nine reasons, we understand the global interdependence and become better global citizens. Our knowledge and the skills which we acquire in geography in Malta has a huge impact wherever we go. And that is testament also of the adaptability and the flexibility and the, the integration of many of our um, graduates who indeed um, went um, to study and work abroad. Geography is made up of a lot of subdisciplines. This is just the list from the Royal Geographical Society in the UK, but there's another list, uh, or there are other lists, of course, also from the American, if, if you want to focus on the Anglo-Saxon world. But when you look at this list and you look at some of the um, topics highlighted here, we do cover quite an extensive um, part of what geography um, is at an international level. And so you see here, many of these topics, which are indeed part and parcel of the program that we study at the university um, and within the program. And there is, of course, this, this interesting mix of physical and human, human geography. What have our graduates been up to? They have been up to a lot of things, as you can see. Um, these are some of the careers which have um, uh, taken up or have employed many of our um, graduates locally and, as I said, abroad. Um, we go from research into the various sectors, whether it is waste, energy resources, biodiversity, um, um, whether it is in planning with, with regards to land use and, and transport. Um, then we have um, um, policy and, and, and data managers, um, analysts, and, and as you can see, the sectors are very broad. Malta Police Force and the Army have, for example, uh, been um, popular um, employers um, to a certain extent, and then the Planning Authority, the Environment and Resources Authority. And these are just the public sector. Of course, there is also the private sector. Today, we have many of our um, graduates working within the um, consultancy sectors. Um, helping out with environmental impact assessments, strategic environmental assessments, um, transport impact assessments, um, and many an increasing number of assessments which development applications um, go through um, as a requirement for, for um, development. So you can see that there is quite a, an interesting mix uh, and, and, and sort of a, a broad um, window of opportunity after after geography. So I've, I invite you to visit our website and our Facebook page, which we keep updated regularly. In the website, you will also be able to see our program, so under our undergraduate program, um, which includes the list of study units. Um, as, as I said, it contains a, a fair share of physical and human geo. Um, and, uh, um, and of course, it, it contains all the details with regards to the individual study units as well. So I'm going to stop here to leave some words for my colleagues um, and we'll take your questions after. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Attart, for really explaining so clearly the essence of geography um, uh, and the value of studying uh, and becoming um, uh, an expert in this, in this area. So thank you very much for that. I now um, I'm going to uh, introduce Professor Shkembri, um, who is one of the most experienced uh, member of staff in our department. Professor Shkembri is, is also um, has the responsibility of being our um, Erasmus coordinator. So he will be also be um, explaining to you um, much of the work that is done by our department when it comes to Erasmus coordination. The floor is yours, Professor Shkembri. Thank you so much, Ruthien, for assisting in this uh, presentation. Uh, well, one of the responsibilities I have in the department 
uh, is uh, being the Erasmus coordinator, and uh, I shall be devoting the first part of this talk about about the Erasm Erasmus exchange program that we have been running since well, actually the, the year 2000, when when our department joined uh, joined the, the the Erasmus program uh, prior to prior to Malta's accession into the European Union, actually. But nonetheless, um, uh, Erasmus means uh, is uh, after a Dutch Catholic scholar who was considered to have been one of the greatest scholars of the Northern Renaissance. Uh, there were a number of Renaissances. You can, in actual fact, there's a geography of Renaissances if you want to uh, come to look at it. And uh, besides the Renaissance that started off, that started off uh, around the, the cent central Italy, there was also a Northern Renaissance of which, of which Erasmus was a prominent, a prominent scholar. Yes, next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, thank you. Erasmus stands for Un European Community Action Scheme for the Mobility of University Students. It's good to know uh, the meaning of this. It is a higher ex education exchange program for students and staff and institutions. The Geography Department at the University of Malta has been participating in the last 20 years with a number of our, our students following the program in European universities and event eventually, and eventually uh, also uh, doing their postgraduate degree research some of them in the universities that they had in actual fact visited as, as, as Erasmus students. In addition to that, um, we, we also do a, a, a research with a number of these universities. So it's not just a student participation here, but it is also staff participation and actually very, very active, I should think. Yes, uh, thank you, same. Next slide. Um, Erasmus started off uh, in various countries, started off in 1987 actually, and Malta joined the, in 2000 and we immediately, immediately embarked, embarked with our university to start sending to and receiving students. Um, and this exchange is uh, actually, this exchange is actually very healthy. This list gives us a, an idea of the extent to which, of the extent to which obviously Erasmus has spread to, throughout Europe and also a timeline so that one can in actual fact know what it is, uh, what it is all about uh, uh, and how many countries uh, are, are involved in it. Yes, next slide, please. Um, the department has, um, programs with 13 universities, uh, Innsbruck in Austria, Prague, uh, Czech Republic, Limoges, Diderot, France, uh, Katalysch University of Reichstag in Gostad in, in Germany, north of Munich, um, Marburg, Marburg, Philips University at Marburg, just north of uh, Frankfurt, Dublin University, Universidad de Studi di Modena and Reggio Emilia, and a number of UK universities, uh, Bournemouth, Kingston, Liverpool Hope, Limit and Portsmouth. So there is a wide range of uh, universities uh, where one can in actual fact go to. Um, and so the results are that um, our students have an embarrassment of choices. Obviously one chooses courses uh, that are that delivered in English or if one is very proficient in French or German, then he can go or she can go to that particular university. But definitely, uh, this is generally done. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is generally done in the uh, first semester uh, of the, sorry, in the second semester of the, of the, of the second year. Yes, uh, thank you. The other slide, please. Next slide. Yes. Thank you. Some of the skills that Erasmus students, uh, uh, in actual fact, uh, uh, learn in a way and practice are integrity, knowledge of uh, integrity. Uh, the previous slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, would be integrity knowledge in your subject area, tolerance, flexibility, openness, intercultural competences and language skills. Now, obviously, language skills, if one goes to, to Britain, uh, the other language skills one would get from other European students uh, 
following Erasmus, Erasmus programs, but also intercultural competencies are extremely important in this day and age, especially, especially to, the young, uh, to the young students. And therefore, one can, in actual fact, uh, really not just learn a subject and practice a subject, but also a skills that might be not that might not be easy to come by to come by over here obviously we have uh, our incoming students and intercultural competences are also practiced there but being abroad being in a different country uh, being uh, having different uh, areas to cover you know um, you will you you will be uh, in actual fact and extremely extremely important in that yes uh, thank you for the next slide please Um, effectively, what I do in my lectures are we look at the also the populations and especially the populations of the earth, and we start off generally the lectures with a very simple situations and effectively trying to measure, trying to quantify uh, the extent to which uh, the populations of the world are, are in actual fact. Uh, uh, increasing uh, throughout time, but also, but, but also now and also uh, in the in the future. As we all know, the world world population is exploding, and therefore it's very important for us to grasp uh, the uh, one of the very one of the basics actually uh, of of the of the situation of the environmental situation of the earth. We all know with the with the COVID situation now how important it is for uh, each and every each and every country in a way to come together to solve uh, to solve uh, actually mutual problems. Yes, next slide, please. Uh, we are we also look into 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 the Mediterranean uh, with a, as, a, as, a, as a regional concept it's extremely important there are big variations between north and southeast and west of the Mediterranean and we'll also look at the at the, at the urban situations of countries that border the Mediterranean especially countries uh, countries that have uh, major cities uh, practically most of them have major cities uh, lying lying on the coastline another very important factor that we tend to look at is the, is the is the densities of the populations generally speaking towns and cities are uh, very densely populated and it is there that uh, problems in, in actual fact in actual fact do do come about uh, the mediterranean we tackle it uh, we tackle it uh, in some detail and therefore and therefore it is a very important a very important facet of all of most of our lectures yes next slide please uh, now basically what i'd like you to appreciate here is that uh, we integrate both the physical and the human geographies so in this case of the mediterranean but what i'd like you to appreciate here is that um, i've put on two slides here one showing Saharan dust uh, blowing uh, across the Mediterranean over Malta in this case, and also and also uh, the volcanic ash coming from uh, coming from Mount Etna over the over over the Maltese Islands. And I'd like to put this on uh, just because uh, the Mediterranean and especially in our case the Maltese Islands are in a situ in the central situation, as you all know. And basically, uh, we do have we do have both physical problems and also human problems with migration through the Mediterranean into Malta and into other countries of, of the of the Mediterranean. As we all know, we are continuously, continuously living this situation. And it is in actual fact the reverse of what used to happen, say 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, when a lot of uh, Mediterranean migrants went into went to other countries, to other European countries, but also to other countries far away from the Mediterranean, like the United States and Australia. So basically, uh, we try also to integrate the physical and the human elements within each uh, practically and uh, every team that we take it. Yes, next slide, please. And this is uh, another case, uh, the migration through time and on these days. Uh, migration through time, the, uh, the, uh, the migration through time, actually the global situation, how men moved out of, in a way, Africa and spread around the world, but also uh, the migration now from sub-Saharan Africa through the Mediterranean and into Europe is also one of the topics that we tend to uh, tackle uh, during, uh, during the, call the lectures on lectures on population geographies and migration. Yes, next slide, please. 
And now what is very important is that uh, immediately after we start this year in 2021, uh, we shall be having a national census in Malta. Uh, this time around is going to be held on the 10th of October. So it will be just immediately that we start. And normally uh, I do deliver lectures on, on the census. I do deliver about three lectures on the census. Now this time, however, uh, we're going to practically focus on the 2021 census. Obviously we will not have the results of the, of the census that we would be uh, just uh, logged in kind of into it. But basically what is, what is important is that we will do uh, the importance of a census, and we will do its, uh, its skills, its techniques, and we will look at definitely the questionnaires that each and every household would have would have filled filled in. So essentially, it is a demographic census essentially. But we will, in actual fact, uh, draw uh, draw situations where we will link uh, turn this into uh, the geography, the geographies of the census, the populations, distribution, etc. And the next slide will effectively show us. Yes, please. It, will, it shows us the extent to which the settlement pattern of Malta has changed. Uh, initially, starting off with the medieval period, the one with the, a lot of loads of dots and small villages and hamlets uh, around Malta before the Knights of St. John came, and then throughout the British period and post independence, with Malta being, as, as we all know, uh, being literally mostly covered up quite a, a high percentage, about 30, 35, 40 percent. You know, uh, it depends on how you look at it, uh, that it has been uh, in a way, in, in a way covered up. Goals always uh, up to now at least in a way has been uh, slight, slightly different, but a uh, true way census we will be definitely be lo looking at the development of the settlement pattern of Malta, at least from the mid 19th century to date now. Thank you. Yes, that's right. Uh, these would be uh, some of my favorites, kind of uh, looking at the, the different uh, urbanization problems that we have in Malta, uh, Malta then kind of in Malta now, uh, same street in Slima uh, with, with the older buildings in mid to late, late 19th century and the other one is today on the left hand side. On the right hand side we have Independence Garden in, in, in the Independence Garden there. And uh, it was in actual fact an area with uh, fields, just like anywhere else practically, and the garden as it is as it is today. So we shall, we shall also be trying to appreciate and putting it, the geographies of change in these uh, in these cases. Yes, thank you. Yes, uh, maritime shipping routes are always extremely important, but also we we'll look at uh, responsibilities through narrow waterways and canals. Um, especially with the, with the narrow waterways, the Mediterranean, as you know, is not just, it is very constricted with the Straits of Gibraltar, Suez, Baba and Mantape, and also eventually even the Middle East, Hormuz, and most of the tankers and container terminals coming through uh, will have to pass through these, uh, through these uh, shipping routes and the narrow waterways. And as you all know, yes, next slide, please. As you all know, what happened last March, actually, uh, the Suez Canal, the Suez Canal was very important when it was opened in the mid 19th century, uh, that it decreased the distance between most, uh, most of European countries and ports uh, through passing through the Mediterranean. They did not have to circumnavigate Africa, but it was blocked and, if, and it was blocked for uh, just over a week. And therefore, and therefore, you had you had the situation where uh, a narrow waterway being blocked, and these are situations that we will definitely look into. That we will definitely look into uh, in the in the in the in our in our lectures. Yes. Now we wish we will we'll look also at harbors and seaports. I've got a, an image of the Malta Harbor there, Maltese harbors. Grand Harbor and Mazam Shet Harbor. We look at the site and situation, the physical geographies of them, peninsulas, creeks, plateaus, cliffs, shore platforms, but also a number of uh, a number of uh, a number of topics. However, we will look at geography at a range of scales. As um, Dr. Professor Attar was in actual fact mentioning, uh, scales are very important for us in, in geography, and therefore we, will, we shall be looking at these. Uh, uh, these harbors in some detail when we do the geography of the of the of the Maltese islands. Yes. Next slide. 
uh, we shall also be looking at agriculture, and this is a, an image where uh, one can look at uh, agriculture in, in, in its most, in its most uh, varied field, but definitely practically in each and every study unit, uh, there, there is uh, an element of field work in it. And therefore, it is extremely important. It's extremely important for us to know the theories, but also, but also, then we we do our own our own fieldwork by looking at crops, looking at distances, looking at various factors around around agriculture, especially especially the, the problems with the soil compaction. Yes. Uh, well, soil is there, and we also do about uh, pedology, and it is extremely important to note. That these uh, that these uh, soils are, as we all know, soils are extremely important, and therefore we will look at uh, we will look at pedology also in its uh, in its in its multiplicity of values that uh, the value it has for our, in a way for our own for our own society, yes. So basically, uh, geography directions are uh, these are some of the journals that we tend to read. Uh, we tend to give students to read the journals and papers. Uh, effectively, the difference between uh, other forms of instruction, uh, reading papers is is very important. Is very important for 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 everybody. For everybody, the Royal Geographical Society publishes. Uh, five journals. The American Geographical Society also publishes a number of uh, and the annals and also the AG review. So the, these would be, uh, in a way, partly the staple, the staple of our reading lists. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to me, and um, I wish you, I wish you all well. Thank you, Ritian, for. Uh, it's now the turn of Dr. Gauci. Uh, to um, deliver her presentation. Thank, thank you, Professor Shkambri. Um, as always, very insightful what you deliver to us all. And we always um, tend to learn something new, especially when seen from your perspective and your experience. I will now share my screen uh, to move to, um, to some physical geography, um, study units and uh, work that we do in in our department and uh, i will be all then followed by mr role who will also be um, giving some highlights as well of what we do um, as physical geography so this is essentially uh, broadly um, a list of the main um, topics which i uh, am responsible for in the geography department um, these are not just units which I teach, but in many ways there are also um, teams which I research in collaboration with my colleagues and in the collaboration with other um, departments within the University of Malta and also in collaboration with other universities um, abroad. So as you can see, um, they're quite varied. Um, a strength in our department is that we tend to not just focus on one aspect, but tend to rather bridge and connect, and that brings strength in what we do. And therefore, what I will do in the next few minutes, because I'm very conscious of the time, I will be highlighting some of the um, details of, of this work that we do with students as well. Um, um, a key component which um, the students, especially in their first year, um, cover is the um, component of cartography and cartometric fundamentals. So what we essentially do in, uh, with our first year students is introduce them back to the um, roots of cartography, not just as, um, as a way to learn about a map and how to read the map, but a bit more than that. It's mostly about the origin of map, the roots of map, and how the maps were a reflection of societies and the way they have grown and changed over the centuries. So we really look at the connection between uh, maps and civilization through the ages. So it will be also an opportunity to see authentic collection of maps, of historic maps, to grasp their, their differences, their similarities, um, and understand their heritage qualities, uh, which we um, conserve today. And therefore also see how cartography is um, relevant in communicating a message to society, was, is, and still is an important means of communication. 
So we'll be examining um, different uh, types of uh, cartographic elements and different types of messages like war maps, disease maps, um, types of maps that try to persuade like propaganda maps and also look at geological maps and how they um, evolve through time. This we don't just do it in class, but we also do it in collaboration with um, important members of the society. We do it with by inviting international speakers who are um, who are an authority in cartography. Um, we had, for example, the Do Dr. Alexander Kant, who is editor of the International Journey of Cartography. We do it also in collaboration with Musa, the Museum of Fine Arts which is the main uh, competent authority that has the largest collection of maps of Militensia maps on the island. And in fact, um, it is the home to the Arbert Canato map collection. As you might well know, maps, historic maps, are not permanent exhibits because of their sensitivity to light and to environmental condition. So maps, the only way to view them and to study them and to appreciate them is through private viewing. And our department, actually organizes lab sessions in collaboration with Heritage Malta in order to view these maps and in order for the students to expose themselves to the heritage, to this huge heritage that we have on the Maltese island. We also um, are very active within um, our civic society, in particular with the Malta Map Society. And thanks to the collaboration with the Malta Map Society, that we also view private collections. We have um, a, a discrete amount of private collectors on the Maltese Islands who uh, pride themselves to have unique works of art in terms of maps. You can see here a private viewing that we had with the current president of the Malta Map Society, Mr. Joseph Skiro, who invited us to his home, who um, invited us to his home and also explained his, first of all, his lifetime experience with maps and also as an emeritus conservator um, of, of materials and of maps. So as you can see, we try not just to show you uh, knowledge, we just expose you to knowledge, but we also expose you to also important members of the society and how they're contributing to engage uh, in improving uh, this, this aspect of heritage. This is um, some brief highlights of a lab session we had at the Museum of Fine Arts. Um, in which, with the uh, participation of uh, Miss Bernardine Schickluna, we could see um, parts of the Albert Ganado Map Collection and students could study and investigate them as part of their curriculum. As Professor Schembri and Professor Tard were, were, um, writes, were rightfully saying, fieldwork is an important component of, of our um, geography degree, both at generals and at um, honors level. And in fact, um, uh, in most of our study units, we uh, pride to um, have uh, an intense component of field works, which um, either are set as a sub study unit or part of an assessment component of many study units. It is through field works um, that we tend to explore uh, the complexities of the um, geographical world from the physical point of view and also from the human point of view. We also, through field works, um, tend to train our students with the latest equipment and techniques in environmental assessment. And through that, they will um, gain a range of skills that are quite difficult to develop if given just in a lecture room alone. It also helps in self-development, in improving your interpersonal skills, in improving um, the students' leadership skills, and also to also um, be able to participate in group work dynamics, which are especially important in the world of employment. In the second year, we also um, cover um, geology as an important component of our curriculum. We um, go through the, all the theoretical knowledge that is important in understanding geology um, as an important um, dimension for landscapes and landforms um, uh, appreciation. We so, so we therefore do the theoretical knowledge about the development and the characteristics of rocks, but it's not just about rocks. In geology, we also apply concepts of how geology was an important driver of society transformation. Uh, the industries that developed thanks to, to mining, um, the development of technology and the geological materials that made, made possible and are still making possible 
the um, invention of specific technologies, including the digital world, which is heavily relying on geological materials. Um, the importance of construction assessments, um, which can guarantee safety and health and well-being in society, um, and how that is important, therefore, the understanding of geology as part of urban safety. We also look at the, um, our geological landscapes as also an integral part of our geoheritage. So we look ge at geology in a very broad and very comprehensive manner. So we understand its full role in, in the making of society and in driving the future of our societies. Another, another um, important theme that we research um, and we teach, but also research extensively, is also in, in geomorphology. So geomorphology, we uh, teach and research the main fundamentals in the um, evolution of landscapes and landforms, in understanding their form, their composition, and their properties. And therefore, it's very important to link again, once again, the physical world and the processes an evolution happening in the physical world and connect them with society and what they are representing and translating into society. So again, we do practical sessions, field works to observe these dynamic interactions between life and its landscapes, but also seeing um, geomorphology both as a threat and a hazard to, to society, to urban landscapes in terms of the processes and some impactful and never changing processes happening, especially on our coast, like storm surges, like floods, landslides, cliff collapse. So we see um, the response of society to these um, geohazards, but also see um, the impacts that eventually arise from the ever changing um, impacts, some of them driven by climate change. However, we see also geomorphology and there also um, an opportunistic light, a positive light in terms of how geomorphology and geomorphological landscapes are key in driving um, the tourism potential, are key in driving the tourism industry in terms of geoheritage, in terms of aesthetic landscapes appreciation, in terms also of heritage recognition in relation to, for example, the establishment of UNESCO geoparks around the world, studies related to geoheritage and what makes up the components of geoheritage. So again, once again, like Professor Schkem and Professor Tart have said, seeing the physical world for what it is, for what it drives, but also how it is being connected to uh, and impacting on our society. We have started the um, international decade of, for, of ocean science for sustainable development. Our uh, department is always uh, pro proactive and preemptive to whatever developments happen at international level. And it is for this reason that a few years ago, we decided to introduce a study unit specifically dedicated to the marine resources and management. It is thanks to this study unit that we tend to address all the most important current and uh, future key issues related to ocean management and the um, in terms of resource management, in terms of issues and pressures in the ocean world, uh, in terms of climate change, blue economy, the, um, the implications of risks and hazards triggered by the exchange of the marine world with the ocean, with the soil, with the atmospheric and, uh, and relation to climate change. So we tend to also look at issues of ocean governance and how we're responding to all these challenges and issues. Um, for those of you who might not know, the university is our partner, has partnered with another five European universities, um, Brest, Cadiz, Split, Danks and Kiel. These are six European universities that have come together to strengthen research and teaching under the, uh, the project of European University of the Seas. And therefore, um, our, pro our department is very active in this, in this project and this initiative in contributing to strengthen the arm of the University of Malta when it comes to the teaching and researching of the marine environment. We had, um, as a department, um, prepared a series of flyers and leaflets um, related to our study program. 
um, the, um, which we now will, since we cannot physically distribute these um, leaflets to, um, to, um, into students and staff, we will be circulating by email. So in the coming days, um, the, um, the staff members of six forms and even the general public will be, um, for those who would require, will be receiving um, the, the, a copy of these leaflets and these flyers, which then they can eventually um, share with their students, share with, uh, with whoever is interested in learning more about our geography program. This is my final slide. Um, I really believe that the best, um, best testimonials and best champions of our program are indeed the students. It is the students who can give you an honest opinion of their experience once they've completed their graduate studies. And this is one of the many colorful testimonials that our students um, celebrate with at the end of their, of their degree program and in preparation for the graduation. And uh, I honestly think that, that you cannot really be more, more um, direct and honest than the students in telling you um, of their experience and um, in being part of our geography program. I, I, I thank you for your attention. Um, there is my email address if you need to um, uh, communicate with me further. And I now I am more than happy to pass the floor to uh, Mr. Avertano Rulle for um, uh, the continuation of, of this webinar. Thank you, Mr. Rolle. Thank you, Ritian. Um, uh, I'm going to <laughs> take your, your last slide, in fact, was, was very, very interesting because it, it ties in with what I'm going to be talking about here. Um, my colleagues have done an excellent job of presenting a lot of the work that, that we do at the university, um, but I want to to make this personal. So I'm going to take it at a personal level. Um, and I'm going to, uh, you know, much like that streamer on the side of the bus that uh, has just been shown now, I'm going to say, instead of what you can do with geography, what can geography do for you? So that is a fundamental difference. So in this case, you know, geography, uh, I guess you're studying geography at, at uh, the junior college or at other um, um, preparatory levels. So in fact, um, uh, it is something which of course must interest you. So if you say you like geography, what is it about geography that really interests you? And why would you want to pursue geography at higher levels? And can you make a career out of it? After all, you know, we're in it here, we, we need to make a living. So. Um, can we make a career out of it? And what can geography give you to help you in other careers as well? So I'm starting off with some impact photos here. This is a formation which is in Stoker's Cave at Fawara and Malta. Um, if someone would like to, uh, to talk about this, we, I will be, I'll be very happy to, to go on about this. But this is um, a, stalact a stalactite on, uh, in, in Stoker's Cave. This is uh, Russell Fennec, Hofra Zairan, Hofra Gbira, okay, St. Thomas Base, uh, near St. Thomas Bay. Um, uh, so you see these particular geomorphic features here. Why is this bay round? I want you to start asking yourselves questions. Geography often gives you the answers. So, <clears throat> can you spot fossils here? Something very simple. This is Montebaldo. These are the fossils. Um, <clears throat> again, those kind of limestones, where are they from? So if you actually go anywhere and you start looking around, you see the world from different eyes because you can then see the processes behind certain things. It will enrich in your life. It will enrich, enrich your life. So um, what does geography deal with? In most cases, we have location. We have ideas about location, absolute and relative. So creates it, this helps us in creating thematic maps. I mean, this, these are exercises which we carry out. So this is, for example, the, the, uh, the state of rubble walls in Malta in the, north, in the Northwest. 
So this is an exercise which we carried out in order to be able to see um, how the areas are, are uh, vulnerable to soil erosion. Um, places, <clears throat> physical and human characteristics. So in the cases of, of going abroad and actually seeing and conducting fieldwork outside the Maltese islands. So what is this person doing? Who is this person? I mean, this is, this is um, a, a, a lady of some, some age actually had just having gone to market, walking home from the market at Weedlow. Notice her dress very, very different from, uh, from the normal Arab dress in other places, because she is Berber. Um, <clears throat> the human environment and interaction. So um, I do a fair amount of work underwater. So I am a keen diver. I've been a keen diver for many, many decades. And <laughs> in this case, so I've, I've seen the, the marine ecology changing over the years. And in some cases, we tend to have an effort to, un to, to change even the underwater landscape to somehow try and have control over it. So we put in these particular um, monuments to a dive club, to a local dive club. And it's, um, it's become, it has become a feature underwater for which many tourists actually go to, to uh, look at this particular feature. Uh, and it's become a tourist product. But in most cases, I tend to work on caves. And in caves, although, you know, marine caves, we think are pristine environments, and they are environments which are forbidding in many cases. And, uh, you know, um, marine, marine caves are actually uh, rather dangerous places. Um, they are also prone to, to, human, to human intervention. Even the fact that divers go inside the caves has a major uh, major impact on the on the ecology of the cave. But then besides that, I found Twisties packets, for example, and I hope I'm not making any advertisements to anyone, but Twisties packets in the inside of Stoker's cave, which is, you know, as remote as you can get. Oops. We talk about movement, flows, migration, trade, traffic. So uh, many of my, my colleagues have actually already addressed these issues, so I'm not going to go over these. Um, uh, so th such issues are the kind of things that we talk about. Regions. So again, in human geography, we tend to do a fair amount of work on, uh, on uh, regions. And the important thing is, what can you do with this information regarding, regarding regions? So what kind of geographic skills can we deliver? So geography really opens your eyes to the environment around you. It gives you a holistic approach to addressing environmental problems or issues. I often see people who are tend to, to be very, very narrow specialists, not looking at the wider picture. And it's the wider picture, which is, which is something which is needed today because we've, we have compartmentalized knowledge in such tiny packets that very often uh, many, many experts don't know what is on either side of that, of that knowledge base. The field techniques, again, um, Ritian has mentioned this. Um, uh, we, we use field techniques, hands-on surveys of particular locations and ecosystems. The skill of writing field reports and writing reports even for, which may have commercial value. And then of course, cartography and GIS. So these are things which, which we work with. So what are the career opportunities? Well, one of the most, uh, one of the most, uh, uh, the greatest providers of, of employment for geography is either the planning authority or area, but also we have geography graduates in agriculture and private industry and EIA consultancy. In the case of planning, we have, the, again, the planning authority and area, the statistics, national statistics authority, we have several graduates who are, are actually uh, employed in, in, uh, in the uh, National Statistics Authority. There's teaching, of course, the Department of Education, private schools. Travel agencies. Well, nowadays, travel agencies are actually uh, not so important as they were a few years ago. But of course, airlines and other, uh, other agencies still employ geographers. Tourism as well. And tourism is, uh, again, geography graduates are in the multi-tourism authority. And if you want a lot of money, real estate agency. 
I know geographers who have actually gone into the real estate agencies and their unique take on, on location gives them the cutting edge over other, <laughs> other real estate agents. Um, uh, so what are my special interests? My special interests are soil erosion, land degradation and desertification, land use planning and environmental impact assessment, and then coastal geomorphology, especially marine cave morphology. Um, I'm mapping a number of caves and uh, that's currently one of my, my, my occupations. Um, with that, thank you for your, for your patience. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ole. It's always very insightful to learn more, especially about your diving and marine experiences. Um, they really enrich the knowledge in our department in that respect. Thank you very much. I now uh, pass the floor to um, our, um, our EGEA Malta president, Mr. Andrew uh, Caruana. Um, Andrew is going to be uh, talking about the work that EGEA does um, in enriching the experience um, of uh, geographers when they study at university um, through the um, uh, through EGEA. I really believe that in order for our program to be complete and to be as rich as possible, it's very important and we also work together hand in hand with EGEA in order to ensure that our students um, as a network and a community can really um, share a wider, a wider network with other geographers across Europe. Andrew, I have the pleasure to leave the floor to you. You have sharing rights if you want to share um, something with us. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so we can see the presentation, I guess. Yes, we can. Okay. So hello everyone. First of all, um, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Hattart and Dr. Gauchi for uh, this opportunity. Um, so to discuss uh, a bit about EGEA. So EGEA is an international a European organization uh, founded in 1987. And its goal is to exchange geographical knowledge and build an international network for students and young geographers and young entrepreneurs. So its structure, so basically the structure of EJR yeah, is normally made up of two contact persons per entity. Uh, EJR is split into 90 entities and we have two contact persons, normally we call them president and vice president. And then to, in order to assess those entities, uh, we have regional contact persons and regional assistants. Uh, and we split Europe into four regions, Euromed, North and Baltic, West and East. And we have an executive body uh, monitoring everything and ensuring everything um, is in order. And if there's any uh, help that's necessary, they, they are always there to assist. And their main office is the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. So here's uh, a brief overview of the AGR entity map. Um, as you can see, there are a number of entities in Central Europe and in the Euro region, Euro mid region, and we have some entities in the North and Baltic as well. So I'm going to mention some events and activities you, that you can attend if you become a member of EJO. So the first event that you can attend is an exchange. Um, basically an exchange, uh, you visit an entity um, and you spend three to four days and you have the opportunity to experience the culture um, 
and make new friends. And then people from the entity that you have visited will then uh, come to Malta. So basically, as an example, um, in fact, we're actually planning exchange uh, in summer. Uh, we're planning to visit Egea Leuven in Belgium. Um, we'll visit uh, Leuven in October, if I'm not mistaken. And then they'll visit Malta at a later stage. Uh, another event that you can attend is the Annual Congress or the Regional Congress. So the Annual Congress takes place every year in September. Unfortunately, this year, the Annual Congress will take place uh, online and, and not as a physical event. And then you can attend four regional Congress. Um, you can attend the regional Congress in the Euromet region or in the West region, Northern Baltic or the East region. Um, basically, the Congresses uh, in the Congresses, you can attend scientific workshops, which um, are super educative and you can learn a bit more than um, certain topics that we are unable to experience firsthand. For example, there are workshops on glaciers. Of, obviously, we don't have glaciers here in Malta. And you can get the opportunity to uh, attend a workshop on glaciers and even visit glaciers uh, during the fieldwork as well. Um, aligned with scientific workshops, we have seminars and scientific events. Uh, if you attend these events, um, along with the congresses, you will get a certificate of participation, which you can add with your CV. Um, which I believe it's super helpful. We then have national and thematic weekends, um, basically cultural events. Um, and we have other events which um, I can pretty much group with national and thematic weekends. We also have newbie weekends, which are basically events we organize for um, members that have joined EGEO so that they settle in and make new friends and learn a bit more about how the organization functions in brief. So if you attend these events, um, you obviously make new friends and um, I'll be showing you some of the pictures from uh, the events that we had the luxury to attend over the past five years. So this is a beach hopping event we organize here in Malta. Um, this is a, an excursion somewhere in Europe. <laughs> um, when you attend a Congress, you also have the opportunity to attend an excursion apart from a field work and scientific workshop. Um, this is a scientific workshop which was held here in Malta. Uh, another scientific uh, excursion, uh, a relaxed excursion here in Malta as well. Um, scientific excursion uh, we had in Bursa Puja in 2019. Uh, we organized the regional congress in the Euromet region in 2019 as well here in Malta. Uh, some pictures from the congress which took place at the university itself. And then this past two year we have organized a number of online activities. Obviously because of COVID we could not organize physical activities. But we wanted to show you that EJS not, does not only organize physical activities, we also organize online activities. In November, we organized uh, a geography awareness week campaign where we live stream online documentaries. Uh, we had documentaries from David Attenborough, from Brave Blue World. We had documentaries that tackled 
um, waste and fast fashion. And then we organize a number of other online activities such as um, an online cook-off exchange. We basically had a meeting with uh, Ijea Marburg and we um, had a lot of fun cooking uh, German recipes while Ijea Marburg cooked Maltese recipes and a nice way to make new friends and experience culture, their culture uh, from an online perspective as well. So um, how can you join EJO? Um, you can sign up um, by uh, going on the following link, ejo.eu slash join. Um, if you do sign up, we will require your name and surname and your username because currently we are updating our website. So we will require your username in order to approve you. You can join our Facebook group and you can follow us on Instagram and you can send me a message on Facebook, uh, et cetera, um, Andrew Caruana. And I finally want to close off by saying, um, the opportunities that EJR contributes to the local geographic scene. So like I mentioned earlier, we organize scientific workshops here in Malta during the UMS Congress in 2019. And we do not simply organize scientific workshops um, and that's it. Uh, we collect the data collected during scientific workshops was then sent to the local agencies, local councils, uh, non-governmental organizations, um, um, because this data is super helpful and um, we believe that um, all the work that was done by the members should um, um, be shared with the local authorities um, because we believe it will be super helpful to them. Um, that's it from my part. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, um, I'll take them. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much for, for that presentation about AGEA, um, a very important um, element not just for our students, but also for the geographical community at large. Time is pressing, so um, uh, before I stop the recording, I want to um, invite Professor Attard for some concluding comments to this webinar. And then I, I will stop the recording and eventually take um, any questions. All of us can take any questions which you might have. Professor Attard, on to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all the speakers. Um, I don't want to take too, too much long. Um, uh, or too much time at this stage. Uh, we're open to answer any questions that um, prospective students might have. Um, there are plenty of avenues. There is, of course, email, there is the website, there is the Facebook page. So do not hesitate to get in touch um, to ask us any question that you might have. Thank you. And thanks for attending. Anyway, I hope you found it interesting. And thanks to Dr. Gauci for arranging this because she's, she's done all the work. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure always. So I'm going to stop the recording. Okay.